love him or loathe him, when Bill Gates talks about the most profound technology he's ever seen, I think you need to listen. Check this out. If he is worried about whether we are in an AI bubble, here's what he had to say. We need to define bubble. If, if what we mean is like tulips in the Netherlands, that they went to look back and said, what the heck, there was nothing there. Those were just tulips. No, that's not where we are. If you mean it's like the internet bubble, where in the end, something very profound happened, the world was very different, some companies succeeded, but a lot of the companies were kind of me too, fell behind, uh, burning capital companies, absolutely, there are a ton of these investments um, that will be dead ends. And do you look at all of the investments that are being made today by some of the big tech companies, some companies who are not making money on AI yet, but are making massive commitments to chip makers and data centers and say, this math makes sense? Um, the AI is the biggest technical thing ever in my lifetime. I mean, it is so profound and therefore its influence is hard to overstate. And the economic value, this is basically intelligence, uh, you know, where you can get medical advice, or you can get a tutor, or you can get somebody to help you design drugs. So the value is extremely high, uh, just like creating the internet ended up being in that, very, very valuable. But you have a frenzy, and you know some of these companies will be glad they spent all this money. Some of them, you know, they'll commit to data centers that, whose electricity is too expensive. You know right. that it could be done overseas, or they'll buy a generation of chips, and and you know they won't have captured all their value before the next uh, one comes along. But you know, if you want to be a tech company, you don't get to say no. Uh, you know, let's check out of but this race. Is, what do you think the public appetite for this is ultimately going to be? And I, I ask because I think there's concerns about two things that are happening right now. One is energy costs. So there's a whole bunch of places where people want to put data centers and, uh, you know, the community says, no, we don't want this because we don't want to have to spend more money for power to power our own homes. At the same time, they're worried that if they actually are successful, they'll also lose their jobs. We need to put things like terrapower nuclear reactors in places where it's very clear that you're not raising the, the residents' electricity bills because that's being put in there. Historically, nuclear was done in a way that the utility bore a lot of that liability. That, that business model won't get repeated. So we need to make sure uh, to pick locations where the economics and the political Acceptance right. is very, very strong. We have we don't have permission right. to drive up people's electricity costs. Uh, you know, in terms of the jobs, this is going to take some period of time. But yes, uh, although it hasn't been seen in large numbers over the next several years, there will be some impact on the job market. Nowadays, when you say that, some people are like, "Oh, how can you, you know?" you know, say that, isn't that going to slow the U.S. down in this race? But it's only honest for people um, to speak frankly about the fact this will have a big effect on the job market. And of course, uh, Gates is a longtime capitalist. So I talked to him about the industrial policy coming from the White House, including the U.S. taking stakes in rare earth and chip companies. You're afraid to say. The government operates best when it's kind of predictable. That is when you know what, you know, what are the tariffs going to be for the next 20 years? Because when you build a, a factory, uh, so the government shouldn't be changing its policy, you know, every year or every day, uh, because, you know, predictability is a very, very important thing. Understanding when the company is helping nascent technology, is it uh, doing that for the good of the country? And you know, not and treating companies equally, or will it want to own part of those companies and not? And if somebody has better technology, they'll favor the company they own part of. And we need to understand what those policies are. Yes, I think there's a rush of people to say, "Wow, uh, you know, maybe that's how to you know get to the front of the line for government money." But the rules of the game we're playing. Are pretty unclear. So that's what Bill Gates had to say. Before I share my thoughts, let's watch the clip of Chris Camillo reacting to this interview too. 
I think, uh, I don't know if it was Bill Gates. I can't believe I'm quoting Bill Gates. Uh, was in an interview this week. I think he said it. He might have actually said it best. I don't know if he gets anything right these days. But, you know, he said if by bubble you mean that we're going through something revolutionary where there will be something brand new created that is way bigger than anything we had before, where there will be winners and losers, then yeah, we're in a bubble. There will be winners and losers, right? Um, we all know that. Uh, there will be companies that uh, are still have a lot of room to grow uh, going forward. And then there's just a lot of stupid stuff being done because we're moving too quickly. Bill Gates says AI is the biggest technological thing in his lifetime and companies don't get to opt out of the race. But he warns some will commit to data centers with expensive electricity or buy chip generations that lose value before the next one arrives. Companies will buy entire generations of AI chips that won't capture full value before newer chips arrive, but they have no choice because sitting out the chip upgrade cycle means falling behind completely. Bill mentioned some people will commit to data centers whose electricity is too expensive, or they buy a generation of chips that they won't have captured all of the value of before the next one comes along. This captures the brutal economics of the AI infrastructure race. Chip generations are improving so fast that by the time you've deployed and optimized workloads for one generation, the next generation arrives with dramatically better performance or efficiency. Think about the math. You spend $100 million on NVIDIA H100 chips, you're maybe 18 months in deploying them, building software optimized for their architecture, and starting to see returns. Then a Blackwell chip arrives offering 2 to 3x better performance per watt. Do you stick with the H100s and capture more value for your investment, or do you immediately start buying Blackwell even though your H100 investment hasn't fully amortized? If you ask me, the correct answer is buy Blackwell immediately, even though it means the H100's lost significant value. Why? Because your competitors are buying Blackwell, and if they can train models faster or run inference cheaper, they can offer better products at lower prices. You're not competing against your own capital efficiency, you're competing against whoever has the best infrastructure. This is different from most capital equipment. When you buy manufacturing equipment, it might last 10 to 15 years before becoming obsolete. You fully depreciate it and extract value over its lifetime. The upgrade cycle on AI chips is very fast. Although they may not be obsolete yearly, it does mean higher effective capital costs because you're constantly replacing equipment that still works but isn't competitive anymore. There are some workloads which are happy to be run on older chips, but if you want to be competitive with the best products and the best models, you've got to be upgrading to the latest versions. Mr. Gates saying you don't get to say no is a key insight. Chip upgrades aren't optional. Tech companies that try to be conservative and extract full value from each chip generation will watch competitors pull ahead. The only option is to accept lower returns on each generation and stay on the upgrade treadmill or exit the AI race entirely. But despite all this spending and inevitable waste, Mr. Gates doesn't think we're in a bubble. But one issue that's not been spoken about much in the world of AI is the issues data centers are having with local communities. Some communities are blocking data centers because residents don't want their electricity bills going up to power AI infrastructure, forcing companies to find locations where it's politically clear that residents won't pay the cost. This is fast becoming one of the biggest practical constraints on AI infrastructure build out, and most people don't realize how significant it is. You can have unlimited capital, access to the latest chips, and strong AI talent, but if you can't find locations where communities will accept data centers, you can't build. The core problem is grid capacity. Local electrical grids were sized for residents and commercial use in those areas. A large data center can consume as much power as a small city. When you add that load to a grid that wasn't designed for it, you either need massive infrastructure upgrades or existing users face higher prices and potential brownouts. Communities are increasingly sophisticated about this. They've watched what happened in places like Northern Virginia, where data center proliferation drove up electricity costs and strained the grid. Now, when a company proposes a data center, local residents immediately ask who's paying for the grid upgrades and will our rates go up? Mr. Gaines points out if residents see their electricity bills increasing up 20 to 30% because data centers are consuming local power capacity, they are likely to vote out their local officials who approved those data centers that makes elected officials very cautious about approvals. The nuclear reaction solution Gates mentions is trying to solve this by bringing dedicated power generation 
to the data center instead of drawing from the grid. But even that faces community resistance because no one wants a nuclear reactor in their backyard, even the modern, more safe designs. This is why places like the Middle East or locations with stranded energy resources are becoming more attractive despite being far from tech hubs. If you have cheap power that currently underutilized and a government that wants the economic development, you avoid the community resistance problem entirely. But then you're building critical AI infrastructure far from where most AI deployments are happening, which creates other complications. The political acceptance issue compounds over time as more communities see negative examples of data centers driving up costs or straining infrastructure, opposition becomes more organized and sophisticated. It's getting harder, not easier, to site new data centers in desirable locations. That means the constraint isn't just capital or chips, it's finding locations where you can actually build and operate without local political resistance killing the project. One of our clients started with zero audience. Now they're doing $100,000 months thanks to YouTube. And they're not alone. We've helped three businesses hit that level just by growing them a YouTube channel. Want to see how this could work for your business? Book a call with me below.